All right, we are wrapping up a series today called One Month to Live, um, and it's kind of ironic or coincidental that Lloyd passed away during this series, um, and when he only had 30 days left to live, and I guess there's no coincidences with God, and so it's just kind of amazing that he lived his last 30 days, and we learned so much from Lloyd's life, um, but we do have this series, and last week, we didn't get to give it, and maybe that's why, because he did pass away during this series, so it's just incredible that that happened, so... Um, please keep his family in your prayers. But as we look at it, we're, we're not really talking about necessarily the morbid part of one month to live, because if you look at the series, you're kind of like, well, I don't know, you know, I don't think I want to think about that. Please, please don't bring it up. So not necessarily the morbid part, but here's what I know. I, I've been by a lot of people in the last 30 days of their life, and here's what I know. They get very focused about what's important. And they also stop looking at some things that are not important. And so we've been talking through this series to go, hey, what if you looked at your life that way and we learned from the life of Jesus who when he, had, when he was you know, here on earth that he, there was a time when he had 30 days left to live and we looked at some principles from the life of Jesus and we talked about that, that Jesus, you know, he, he, he lived passionately, that he loved completely, that he learned humbly and finally today we're going to talk about he left boldly and how do we do that? What I wanna, how I want to wrap up this series though is this, I just want to start with a question and the question is this. How do you have the best life? What do you got to do to have? Have you ever thought about that? Like, have you ever evaluated your life and said, is this the best possible life that I could have? Or, or some of us are old enough to go, we did have maybe, or we had dreams of having the best possible life, and then our life took kind of a turn, and we're like, it isn't. <laughs> and I don't know that I could ever have that. But what I want to talk about today is this, how to have the best life. If you do what we talk about today, there's not many things in life you get a guarantee. But here's the guarantee, and it doesn't come from me, it comes from God himself. If you do what we talk about today, it's guaranteed you'll have the best life. If you don't do what we don't talk about today, you will not. You might have a good life, but you'll never have the life that he's talking about here if you do this one thing. Now, I'm not teaching this, this is what he's teaching, but that's a guarantee. Would you like to know what that one thing is? Here's what we're going to talk about, how to have the best life what gets in the way of the best life, because you could have it, and then there's some things that get in the way of it, <laughs> how to get over those things, and how to do this, and how to have the best life that God truly wants you to have, and um, so hopefully that's worth some of our time. So if you would pull out your Bibles, um, we'll get right into it today. It's a very short story. What I want to talk about with the Bible is Matthew or Luke chapter 10, if you want to turn with me, um, or look in your outlines, or it'll be up here on the screen. We've got lots of ways to do it. This story is one we've used a bunch of times. So if, you, if you're a church person or you've been to church a lot, you've probably heard this story. What, I'm, what There's a danger in that is, if you're new, then this is great. You're, you're perfect. We're glad you're here because you'll get something out of this. <laughs> Everybody else, here's where you could really go wrong. You've heard this story a thousand times. It's a very short story. You think you know where it's going, and then you're going to miss the point. And here's what, I, here's what I know. It's such a small point, but such a profound point, that you will not have the best life if you miss this point. You might think you have it and don't, and it's really dangerous, okay? Is that, is that dramatic enough? Okay. <laughs> Pay attention. <laughs> okay. Luke chapter 10. So to set it up, Jesus had started his earthly ministry. He had become very popular. Um, if you know who Jesus is, he had become very popular because Jesus did miracles. And so people would come from all around. Not only did he do miracles, but they also, he also was popular because they thought he was Messiah. And so they were kind of following him and figuring him out. And when you're around large crowds of people, I don't have large crowds of people around me, but I do know how exhausting it can be to be around people. You know what I mean? You, you have that around different people. And so it just gets very exhausting. And so he had times where he would get alone with some friends. And he had several of them, but he, but he had one family in particular. They were kind of like his best friends, and he would go there just to relax. You have friends like that? Where you just show up at their house and you're feel, you feel free to go in their refrigerator and stuff like that? I mean, like that's the kind of friends like you don't have to straighten up for. Now, not everybody agrees with that in the household. You know what I'm saying? Like some people think, hey, it's okay. What do you mean by straight? But then they come in and it kind of messes everything up. Like, oh, my goodness, I can't believe they saw this. Or I can't believe they didn't tell me they were coming because our house looks so terrible. Or you come to our house and Marie's like, I can't believe you let them in. <laughs> see how we actually live. To see how we actually live, you know. Um, <laughs> and we have a dog and there's usually like fluff everywhere because he's destroyed stuffed animals, stuff like that. <laughs> And, uh, and so, but that's, you know, so this is the kind of situation. And so Jesus is wore out and he's going to some friend's house. Um, Luke chapter 10, verse 38 says this. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. Now, later on, we find out they, he did know them and, and they, they were really good friends. But she opened her home to him. What I want you to, I want you to underline that because here's what I want you to see. It's very easy in this story 
to make Martha the villain, okay? And the first thing I want you to see is Martha is not a villain, okay? And, and for the people that are like Martha, you're not a villain. If you have the personality type of Martha, you're not a bad person. And by the way, please, people that don't have that personality, don't vilify Martha because Martha is probably the best cook, okay? Her name is Martha. It's usually a good chance she's a good cook, and she is. And so, <laughs> so you don't want to mess with the cook, okay? I mean, really. But... But see, but the story starts off good. She opened her home to Jesus. Can I tell you something? They were about the best friends Jesus had on the earth. She, he just showed up at their house, hung out with them. He loved being with these people. That's pretty good, right? So what could possibly be the problem with Martha? Okay, we'll get to it. Uh, verse 39. She had also had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet. Can you underline that? Actually, just underline this one part, listening. She sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. Now, that sounds very formal because of the way it's written. It's kind of like she's sitting at the Lord's feet learning as if she's like a student. That's not exactly the atmosphere. And, and because of the way we learn today, we're thinking of a classroom where you're pulling up a table and chair and you're learning at this, this you know, guru's feet. That's not exactly the way it is. It's more like this. She's hanging out with Jesus and she's learning some things from him. She's doing life with Jesus. She's, she's enjoying time with Jesus. That's what it's like. You get the picture? You, you understand there's a difference between studying and um, and, and being with somebody? Let me, let me see if married couples can understand it. I, I can spend time with my wife, or I can study my wife. <laughs> can I tell you, my wife likes me to spend time with her. She doesn't like me to study her. I don't know if you, I don't know, if you know the difference. She doesn't like me to psychoanalyze her. Anybody? She don't like me to try to figure her out. <laughs> Pay attention to that, because I think God feels the same. Now, this is going to blast a lot of theologians today. Can I tell you, this is why I say, the people that think they have this, you probably don't. The people that have studied it most, probably don't. Because you've ended up studying God, and he's going, think of, think of your spouse when you think of that. You figure God out. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> that's what God needed. He needed somebody to figure him out. He's, he's infinite. He has all power. He's always been, and he needs you to figure him out and tell him what he is like. I don't need you to do that. You know what I need you to do? I need you to spend time with me. Okay, you get the picture. So she's doing this incredible thing where she gets to spend time with Jesus. Wouldn't you like to spend time with God? It was awesome. So he's there, and he's spending time with Mary. Okay, you get the picture. All right, let's move on. Verse 40, but Martha. So if you could circle the word but, here's where it comes in. It's kind of like everything's going good up till this point, nothing to correct. So don't think of it as bad, but there's always this thing where, like, you can almost look at a person, and they kind of get a twitch. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> There's some people that do that, and it's like there's something that sets them off, and it's like a twitch. It's like they were okay, they were happy, and then all of a sudden it's like they're, they come back to, to, like, I don't know, evil, or I don't know what it is. But anyway, but you get the picture. So, but Martha, and it's like something happened to her, and here's what happened to her. But Martha was distracted, circle that word distracted, by all. Circle it by all. By all what? She was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. All the ladies in the room, you all want to say amen to that? I mean, when we have Thanksgiving dinner and we think it just comes together, <laughs> the men, right? I mean, we're watching football and you're preparing it, and we think that Thanksgiving is awesome, and y'all don't. <laughs> you know, it's like I was learning that from my wife. It's like all the preparation had to be made. All these people coming and all these personalities, and we're like, ah, this is the greatest day ever because we just eat, and it's just so fun to hang out. And they're like, yeah, okay, thanks, John. <laughs> By all these distractions, do, please don't vilify Martha because we're going to be in bad shape, okay? Martha is not a bad In fact, I want you to say that to the person. Like, Martha is not a bad person, okay? That's not, she's not. Jesus loves Martha just as much as Mary. Please don't get this wrong. Jesus loves Martha's personality. By the way, he created her. He loves her personality just as much as Mary's, but there's some drawbacks to both, and today I just want you to pay attention to Martha, okay? She was distracted by all the preparations she had to make, and she came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me here to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. <laughs> I don't know, I'm just thinking of something. Okay, so, <laughs> so, so you get the picture, right? I mean, Martha... <laughs> She's irritated. You ever been that? You're, you're, any type A personalities in the room will get what I'm talking about, right? You're in there working away and slaving away, and they're in there just hanging out and not helping, and you're annoyed. And I have a feeling she's kind of annoyed because she did like things perfect. You know, if you did this, or like in my wife's case, I don't want to say she's OCD, but okay. But if you moved one magnet on the refrigerator, it would drive her crazy. So I did that for years, just walk in and, you know. <laughs> who, who did that? You know, as soon as she walks in, she notices it, right? I didn't even know there was magnets. You know what I mean? People come in and they're like, did you notice? I was like, I don't notice anything. 
And I, love, I hate that question where they go, do you know something different? <laughs> Please don't ask that. I mean, no, I don't notice anything different ever, you know, so. <laughs> anyway, you get the picture. Different kind of personalities. That's Martha. And she's irritated. I think she's irritated on two levels. And she's being a little passive aggressive here. And this is a guilt message. And it's really telling Jesus, you showed up unannounced. And I don't really like that because, you know, now we know you're God. <laughs> and you showed up at my house and we have to do all this. Now, I've got to be really careful because my mom's here today. And I said it first service, but I'm going to be careful how I say this. There are some people that do this, okay? It's just what people do. You know those people? It's like you don't have to do all this stuff. <laughs> I'm sorry. She's really getting mad. <laughs> you don't really have to do all this stuff. But you know why we do it? You know why we have to have our house clean to the standard and everything done up? And, and when people come, that's just what you do. Okay, that's what we learn. Okay, growing up. It don't matter. I mean, who, and we're like, who are those people? I'm people, but that's okay. You know, whatever. <laughs> I don't think that, but people do. Okay, whoever those people are, I don't want to meet them, but okay. <laughs> she does, and that's important. Okay, so you clean up for those people. Okay, that's Martha. And that's not bad, because if it wasn't for Martha, we wouldn't eat, okay? If it wasn't for Martha, we'd live in filth all the time, and it would just be terrible. So it's awesome to have Martha. But here's what she's doing. Jesus, I can't believe you came over here, and now I have to have this full-course meal for you, because that's what's expected of me. By who? Nobody has that expectation but Martha. She's doing it to herself. And so here she is, and she's fixing all this stuff, and she's trying to clean, and she's mad because Mary's not helping her. And she comes in there, and she's really mad at Jesus for going, you should have told me you were coming. That's really what it is. <laughs> now, you tell my sister to help me, because she didn't want to correct him. She's like, well, he is God. Oh, okay, so, so uh, let's not do that. I know the plagues and everything, so let's leave him alone and just kind of do it through him. So it's a passive-aggressive. Anybody got those? You get the tone, right? I'm annoyed, and I'm annoyed, and so I'm going to throw this out. And the only good part about this part is she's expressing herself. Don't be too mad at Martha. You know what's good about this? She said what she thought. Jesus isn't mad at Martha. Please understand that. I've heard this story told wrong many times, like Martha's this villain, and she's terrible, and Jesus didn't understand her, or Jesus doesn't love her, or Jesus was mad at her. He wasn't. He's like, it's good to express yourself. It's good to get this out. That's how you're really feeling. I'm glad you said it. That's how you really feel. She should be helping me. You know why she was doing that? Because it's so important for a person like Martha to do. You know how they show their love? Doing things. And Jesus is sitting there. That's why I say type A personalities are going to struggle more. It doesn't mean that non-person strike. You'll see in just a minute. It doesn't mean that just because you don't have that personality type doesn't mean you don't need to pay attention because you do. Because you could miss this just as easily as Martha. Be careful. All right. So here's what he does. Verse 41. Jesus says this. Martha. Martha. Twice. Now, did he stutter? Did he, you know, I mean, what is he doing here? I can tell you what he's doing. He's snapping her out of it. He can see her amping up. You ever seen a person do it? You know, you know those people, right? You're here in the passive-aggressive phases. And so what he's doing to her, he's not reprimanding her. What he's doing is he's snapping her out of it. Martha, Martha, I can see you're getting in crazy mode. Okay, okay. <laughs> he didn't say that. He's very smart. <laughs> Don't say that to Martha. <laughs> Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You were worried. Can, can I ask you to circle something? Circle worried. You were worried and upset by what? Many things. What's your problem? Is there things to worry about? Sure, of course. You are worried. He, he's, he's saying a problem. And, she, and I think at that point, she's like, that's true. And I have a lot to worry about because I'm doing all the work and she's not. We need to do more. We need to do more and that'll fix it. She needs to help me and we'll do more. And that's going to fix the whole problem. And he's going, your perspective's all wrong. And he's about to give her a perspective. I want you to pay attention to verse 42 because here's how it's going to go. This is very short and it's one last verse. And the problem here is this. You're going to hear it, and you're going to go, yep, got it. And I can tell you this. If you're worried today, you don't got it. Can I be clear? If you're worried, you don't got this, and you're going to miss the best life possible. <laughs> now I got your attention. You're like, I don't think I like that. Yeah, and Martha didn't either. So he's calling your name right now. He's saying, Barbara. I'm just playing Barbara. <laughs> Daryl told me to say that. You can hit Daryl later. <laughs> I'm just playing. Sorry, sorry. Okay, sorry. All right, verse 42, here's what he says. Martha, you're worried about many things, but, but few things are needed. That's not actually what he wanted to say. Here, he, he wanted to say, you don't need all this stuff that you're doing. You know all these people out there, they don't exist. It's me. It's Jesus. Stop. 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 On, indeed, only one thing is needed, Martha. Now, I've heard this told many ways, and I'm not saying they're wrong, 
I just think I'm more right. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've, hold, I've heard this story told many ways, and one of the ways is this, is that we only need one dish. And I, and I don't think, say that's necessarily wrong. You know, hey, you're fixing this full course meal with all this stuff. You're trying to straighten up everything. You don't need all that. All we need is a small snack. That's all we need. That's, that's probably not untrue, but I think this is more true. <laughs> you only need one thing. And what I want you to focus on today is this, the one thing that you need. Because if you don't got it, you won't have the best life. If you get it, if you get what Jesus talks about here, you will have the best life. It's a guarantee. And he tells her what it is. Now, Jesus doesn't compare, understand that. He's simply pointing out something that she did. Because here's what I know. The people that don't have it will take it away from the ones that do. Or they try to. (laughs) And he looks at her and he says, Mary... Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Mary is doing the thing that's most important. She's doing the one thing. It has nothing to do with food. i tell you something. It has nothing to do with what she's doing. It has to do with him. And he's going, you're missing the most important thing, Martha. Now, don't hear me wrong. It's not, I'm not saying that what we do isn't important. Please don't hear me say that. Please don't hear me say the people that are type A and driven and God put that in you, that you're a bad person. That doesn't mean what it means. It means the people that are like that will struggle more with this because you're going to think what you do equates to your relationship with God, and it doesn't. Relationships isn't just what you do. Ask your wife. They'll tell you, right? When, when the husband comes in, they go, after everything I've done, don't you know, I, I don't have to say I love you. I've done all this, right? And they go, well, that don't mean nothing to me if that's how I feel, right? <laughs> okay. You get the picture. Right? <laughs> I've never actually heard that, but okay, I got you. <laughs> Now, now, now you understand from the human perspective. Can I tell you, God feels the same. And he's going, you're missing it all because you're so busy doing so many things, Martha. You get the picture? So how do you have the best life? Very simple, okay? You can write this down. It's a very profound statement. And, and you're, you're probably going to be blown away by the, by, by the profoundness of what I'm about to say. To have the best life, you have to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's it. You can write it down. In fact, we made a slide. There you go. Have a relationship with Jesus. Now, Anybody surprised in a church that we would say that? No, nah, probably not. Here's the problem. A lot of people think they have it and they don't. Because here's what you're going to think, and this is what the churches have taught, and this is where I think we go wrong. You see, Martha was a believer in Jesus, was she not? She was his best friend. <laughs> in fact, she was so best friends with Jesus, he felt comfortable just showing up at her house unannounced and going right on in. And she welcomed him into his home, said, please don't think Martha's an unbeliever. She's not. So there is a point of saying, started in a relationship with Jesus, receiving Christ as Savior, that's so important in your life. And if you haven't done that, you're missing the best life ever, okay? But I'm not just talking to the person that hasn't received Christ. I'm talking to the person that has. And think, because you've studied God, because you prayed a prayer. Hey, let me tell you, I can say I'm married, right? And I can study my wife, and I can believe in my wife. But if I don't spend time with my wife, I don't have much of a relationship with her. Can I tell you, you can study God, and you can know God, and you can believe in God, and you cannot have a relationship with God, and you will miss the best life. And I can tell you this, if you're worried, this is the reason why. And I know what that's doing to you because it's the same thing it's doing to me, but I have a reason. Can I tell you why? And can I tell you what's making you miss the best life? The same thing that does it for Martha. Distractions. Right? He, he said it. He said, you know what your problem is? Martha, Martha, you're missing the most important thing in life. Can I tell you what it is? It's the relationship with me. She's sitting with me, but you can't. Why? Why can't you? Because I'm worried, because I'm distracted. You're worried about all these things, and I can tell you the one thing that you need is sitting on this couch with me. I don't have time. This is what you're going to say. I'm telling you because I say the same thing. I don't have time to sit on the couch with Jesus because i got all these things to do, and all these things are good. And he's going, yeah, they probably are, but they're not the best thing. And not only that, if you do those things, you're going to miss the one thing that you truly need for the best life. You go, well, that's way too simplistic, isn't it? It is for me, I know. I mean, I'm a complicated person, and this is way too simple to say something like that. Let me tell you why I know it. It's not me saying it, it's Jesus. There was another occasion where he was with the disciples, and he said, I can see you guys are worried about a lot of stuff. So you're worried about your life, aren't you? You're worried about what you're going to eat and what you're going to wear and what you're going to do. And they're like, yeah, because if we don't eat, we're going to die, right? 
If we don't do this, we're going to do this. And, and he went on and on and said, you know, by you worrying, let me ask you a question. Do you, can you add one cubic inch to your height? Nope. By worrying, can you add one day to your life? No. Nope. Then why do you worry? That's basically what he was saying. He said, you need to be worried about the one that can kill both the body and the soul. Remember when he said that? And then he said something else. He said, I'll tell you what, let me explain how this works. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these other things will be added to you. Now, do you understand why I said the most important thing? Do you understand why I said if you want the best life, put Jesus first? Spend time with Jesus is what he's talking about? Now, you say, well, he said the kingdom of God. Yeah, who is the kingdom of God? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, you thought the kingdom of God is a place. He said, I am the kingdom of heaven. When they asked him, they said, this temple, what is the temple, the physical temple? No, me. The kingdom of God is Jesus Christ, and where he is, is the kingdom of God. Heaven's not heaven without him, trust me. You don't believe me. Take people you can't stand at Disney World, and you'll find out real quickly, it don't matter how great the place is, it's who's there, right? <laughs> I'm not saying I've ever done that, but okay. <laughs> okay, you get the picture, right? And he's saying you're missing it because you're distracted by many things because there's so many distractions. That's why you can believe in Jesus. You can have a relationship, and then you get that twitch, and you're like, you're back to all that stuff because you get distracted because life will do it to you. So I want to tell you a couple things about distractions, and then I want to tell you how can you have this. Because I got to tell you, I struggle with it just as much as you do. This is not easy. I wish it was. It sounds easy, but it's not. If it was, you wouldn't be worried. Okay, you got me. All right, here's some facts about distractions. Number one, number one, distractions are simply this. They're urgent things that are not important. If they were important, God would want you to get to it. But he's telling her, it's a lot of good things you're doing there, but they're not important, Martha. They're urgent. Oh, I can see cleaning the house is important to you. More important than Jesus, isn't it? I can see fixing all this stuff. I can see doing all these things. I can see being involved in every man, activity known to mankind is important to you. I can see that going to church all the time is so important to you. Oh, you didn't know I would tell you that one, did you? Can I tell you who the worst offenders are in the world? Can I tell you where the place that's so urgent and so unimportant is? You're going to not like this from a pastor, but I've thought about this for years. The church, half of what we do, we go... Half of what we spend money on, we go, what are you doing? What is that about? Does it have anything to do with God's kingdom and what Jesus wants? No. And you know why we end up doing stuff like that? Because we're not spending time with Jesus. Oh, we went to a seminar, <laughs> but we didn't spend time with Jesus. And he's going, I don't need all that stuff. And by the way, the people you're reaching don't need all that stuff. You know what they need? They need Jesus. Help them reach their Jesus. And if you want to use, and I'd say make the biggest invite and spend the most money on reaching people with the gospel, and it usually looks nothing like what people think of as church. Really don't. That'll bust paradigms on it. It's got nothing to do with our traditions. It's got everything to do with Jesus. And when you embrace that, it will change your life. But here's the problem. The reason why the urgency works on us is because it comes followed by a guilt message. Somebody tells us, sorry, Mom, <laughs> those people... What people? He's going, I'm most important. If you follow me, you spend time with me, I will help you with all the rest. If you don't, you're going to miss it. Does that make sense? Because you don't know enough. Here's what I know about myself. I'm not smart enough. <laughs> and believe me, because I've done a lot of urgent things in my life. I'm not smart enough to know what's important. That's why i got to meet with Jesus. Distractions will take you off of that. Okay, number two about distractions. This is a hard one. Distractions are a choice. If you're going through a hard time, you're going to be mad when I say that. <laughs> As I would be mad at you if you said that to me. What? What's going on in my life you have no idea and I have no choice but to do. That's what you hear a lot of. And you'll hear every excuse known to mankind why you can't. God wants to empower you today. And he wants to tell you that nothing can keep you from him. But it is a choice. You can be distracted, or you don't have to be. You can keep going, Martha, or you can spend time with me, but you can't have both. You can be worried, or you can have Jesus, but you cannot have both. And it is a choice. Ooh. That means no matter what your circumstances, you can have Jesus and joy and peace. 
or you can have worry in this life, but you cannot have both. It is a choice. And somebody needed to tell you. I can tell you who doesn't want you to think it's a choice. You want to know who it is? You want to know who wants to distract your life by so many good things and say you have no choice but to worry because it's not going to get better and you have to be stuck and you have to be worried and you have to do all this stuff and you have to have all this resentment and you have to have all that and it ain't Jesus. And you're looking at him. Don't look at him. It's not a person, okay? It's the devil, okay? You're going, I'm looking at him. Okay, no, don't do that. Okay, don't do that. Distractions are a choice. <laughs> The last thing is this, and this is a very important piece to it. I've learned this somewhat in my life. Distractions never end, okay? They'll always be there. The reason I say that is because sometimes people, it's like, well, don't you think I can get past it? Yes, I think you can get past that one, but another one will come. Because here's the danger in this. If you think you're going to obtain it, and I spend one day with Jesus, and now I'm good, you're in trouble because it don't work like that. People that are older, you tell me, does life get easier? Does life get less busy all of a sudden? You suddenly don't have busy? Because here's the danger in this. You're going to say, I'll spend time with Jesus. When? When you got 30 days left to live? That's when it'll become important, right? When I have one moment left to live and you go, I could have been spending time with Jesus, but I haven't. And now my life is a, is a mess because I didn't know what was important. You get the picture? This is why this is so important. And the danger is, I'll get to it when everything slows down. <laughs> Can I tell you something about that lie? Because the devil has the best lie ever, and it's this one. I'll get to it when I'm less busy. I'll get to it when things settle down. Let me dispel of the, <laughs> the biggest lie ever told. You're never going to be less busy. You are never going to be easier. Life doesn't get easier, it gets harder. Nobody wants to say it, but as you get old... If, Lloyd, if I could bring Lloyd back here today, I promise you he would come and say, as you get older, it gets harder. I read his last letter. He's like, life is tough, and it doesn't mean there's not hope. But even Jesus said, in this world, there'll be trouble. Don't be surprised there's trouble in the world. But so many people are. I'll get there when it's this fantasy of life being perfect. It's never going to be. And if anything, it gets worse. Because the older you get, what I've learned is, the more people you're looking around and you're going, they're missing. They're not here, and there's pain, and there's hurt, and there's all kinds of stuff. So what's the hope then? Jesus. And distractions keep you from him. And when you have Jesus, you will have joy, no matter what the circumstances. You will bring heaven to earth. You get the picture? You don't have to wait. See, somebody's saying, I'm going to heaven. You don't need to wait. You can bring heaven to earth with Jesus. Because heaven is Jesus. Okay. Distractions will always be there. Don't wait. All right. So how do you overcome distractions? How do you overcome a distracted life? How do you have the best life? Meet with Jesus. Oh, meet with Jesus every day. That will change your life. You want the best life? Meet with him every day. Well, I don't know. Do I really need to do that? No. <laughs> you don't have to. But how many problems you got, right? How much worry you got? How many people think it would help you if every day you could meet with Jesus? Let me tell you something. In the Garden of Eden, when he created mankind, you know when he met with them? You know how often he met with them? Every day. Did he spend all day with them? No. Now his presence was with them. I get it. I mean, I get that. We're praying all the time and all this kind of stuff. That's not what I mean. I meant the, the actual relational part where he spent time with them. He'd come in at the cool of the day and he would walk with men. You see, the problem is, is that this isn't the picture we see of Jesus. Now, this is my picture. I think it would be my mom's too, right? Walking on the beach, right? Not a prayer chamber that looks like a tomb. You know, like, that's what most of us think of is this thing. You're like, I sit down at this desk and learn, and that's what we're thinking of. No, 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 no. This, that's Jesus. Walking with Jesus, spending time with Jesus in this beautiful place or wherever it is or wherever you're at. And he gets to just come into your life, into this chaotic life, and just spend a few minutes with him. That's what it's like. I just want to make sure we're clear on what we're talking about here. Not, a, you know, some people are like, I hate school. Yeah, I know. That's not what we're talking about. I don't know if I like to read. Well, there's other ways to do this. We'll talk about it. Okay? Meet with Jesus every day. So I've got some suggestions for how to meet with Jesus. Okay? Because sometimes we don't put the wheels on it, and then, and then we leave just feeling guilty. Like, I want to do it, but then, <laughs> I'm sorry, there's some real barriers. 
And I want to talk through just a few of those, okay? So the first one is this. Number one, if you want to spend time with Jesus, if you really believe this and you think it's important to, and you're really not getting success, number one, have a plan. If you meet with Jesus every day and it's going well, you don't need to have a plan. You got one. If you miss it and you go, it ain't really working out, but I'm going to get to it someday, you need to pay attention to this. It's the same with husbands and wives. Can I tell you something? When you first meet, and this is the problem, you think it's just going to happen, okay? All right, so when you first meet, and we got some newlyweds, I won't point them out, but, but they make you sick. You can probably tell who they are because you'll see them, or, or you know, some people getting ready to get married, and they make you sick. I don't want to point them out, but they're <laughs> just fine. You'll see what I'm talking about, right? I mean, and it just is gross. I mean, nobody likes that because why? Because it's like they're so into each other. Okay, you know. <laughs> nobody wants to see that okay but but you get the idea but it's like that's why life is easy sorry i'm so sorry I just alienated all the young adults okay so but but the what, why do i say that because in the beginning it's so easy why because it just happens because it's like that person's there and it's wonderful and it's just like life is walking on a cloud and you spend all your time with that person and it just happens that's how it starts now after marriage and some of you guys look a little bit older <laughs> um yeah, you'll understand this part it doesn't Okay? Because then you have kids and you have responsibilities and life tends to pull you and you have all this stuff going on and you're like, I wish it could be like that. We really want that. It's not that we don't want that. It's, it, we didn't start off going, hey, we don't want to spend any time together. Anybody done that? No. You know why we don't? Because life happened. And we don't have a plan. And we thought it was just going to happen. And it doesn't. It's why the psalmist says, what? Remember the wife of your youth. Why? Did you forget her? No. Because it won't happen naturally. You have to make it intentional. And if you want to spend time with God, it's the same. If you don't schedule time with God, it ain't going to happen. You don't put it on your calendar. Let me tell you something. If it is the most important thing, and I'm sitting here, and I know it sounds like a small thing, if you've got to miss work to spend time with God, now please don't hear that I'm saying that you need to spend time with God and not go to work. But I'll just be honest with you. Is your job more important than spending time with Jesus? Because if it is, I've got to tell you something, you're in trouble. Because he controls everything. He controls whether you have a job or whether you have breath or whether you have anything. Is, is spending time with Jesus more important than ball? You get the idea? Now, understand, he don't want to take up all your time, but hear me out. If you can't spend 15 minutes a day with Jesus, I would be careful saying you're his follower. I'll just be honest. 15 minutes is 1% of your waking hours, and you claim that he is your Lord and Savior in all, in all for you, and you never spend time with him, but you study him and you come to church. Please, you don't know him. He don't know you. He wants to. This is not guilt. This is he wants to spend time with you. Okay? Plan it. Put it on your schedule. Journal it. Why? That way you got documents. Is it going to hurt you if you miss one, one day? No. I miss one day talking to my wife. Sometimes I'm out of town. But if I miss a lot of days, we're married, but we don't have no relationship. You get the picture? Same thing with God. And we don't think of it that way, but it is that way. And Jesus is saying in this story, he's going, you're missing the most important thing. What are you doing? You're doing all this other stuff. And I told you, if you put me first, everything else will work. You mean he'll take away all my bad circumstances? No, he'll be there with you in all your bad circumstances. He'll give you a new perspective that's even better than the circumstances because you'll have him. Okay, plan it. Number two, number two, get some help, okay? Because it's confusing. Now, you might not think that, but the way he, he does it today, it would be a lot easier if Jesus said, hey, you just walk in this door and spend some time with us, okay? But that's not exactly how he does it. He gives us a Bible, which is awesome, but it is also confusing, is it not? If we were being real honest, there's a lot of people that say, I want to spend time with Jesus, but I do not understand how to read this, right? Is that true? Or are we just, I know y'all are acting like that, but I'm telling you, I've heard y'all read it and say, man, I'm very bored with that, okay? You don't really say it, but I know. That's why... I could ask how many people read the Bible through multiple times. <laughs> okay, you get the idea. Why? Because it's tough to read. We don't know how. So get some help. You need some people around you to go, hey, they're getting some pretty good quiet time. Let me find out what they're doing. Okay, that's what a community group is. Get some encouragement. Okay, let them share with you. Let some, let some incredible teachers help you with learning that and spending time with Jesus and letting them speak into your life. You get the idea? We have a class called How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. If you need me to send you the link, it's on YouTube. We can send you the syllabus. Just write it on your connection card. We're making you make the effort, okay? Because <laughs> if you don't make the effort, you're not going to do this, okay? So you get the idea. And, and if you want to search it out on YouTube, it's that right there on YouTube, four sessions. The, the um, links are right there for the syllabus. 
And it just teaches you, hey, how do I read the Bible? How do I journal? How do I know how to interpret the Bible? Where should I start reading the Bible? That kind of stuff, okay? Maybe you have those questions. And as you do, here's what you'll learn. You might have, as you start to journal, here's what you'll have. 365 things that God has said to you. Imagine that. Imagine if you only had 300. Imagine if God gave you a promise every single day as you read his word, and now when you're in crisis, you could flip in there and go, here's 300 things God has said to me. Would that change your life? Wait a minute, I can tell you it changes your life. You know how I know? Because that's, if I do that, it changes my life. When I don't, it doesn't. And he's going, spend some time with me. Okay, it's so important. The other thing is, if you've got a smartphone, if you've got a smartphone, hold it up. No, I'm just playing. Don't do that. <laughs> but but um, if you've got a smartphone, which most people do, um, please download this app. It's called the Version. You'll have the Bible with you everywhere you go, everywhere your phone is. The only place this doesn't work is in Zuni, because I don't know. I'm just playing. <laughs> in Zuni, you're going to need one of these, okay, because uh, they just don't have stuff out there. And <laughs> no high-tech rednecks out there in Zuni. Okay, you get the idea. All right, so get some help. Number three, enjoy it. This is a word straight from the Lord. Number three, enjoy it. Is that right? Number three? Can we put up number three? <laughs> enjoy it. There you go. Thank you. See, that's a distraction. You get the idea. Y'all know what I'm talking about now, right? Enjoy it. Why am I saying this? I feel this is from the God. He's going, please enjoy your time with me. Please don't make this drudgers. Please don't start off and go, you're going to spend 20 hours a day with me. Don't do that. He don't even want to do that. He's got things for you to do, okay? But here's what he wants, okay? If you like coffee, this is a great, this is a great way to do it, okay? We used to say, hey, to limit your time with the news, just drink one cup of coffee, and if, after you're done, stop listening to the news. It really helps. But here's what I'd say. Start your day with your, cup, your first cup of coffee, okay, <laughs> with Jesus. It's a reminder. If you really drink coffee every day, do that and see what happens. It, it, and pour some for him. You don't have to pour a lot, okay? <laughs> You may not drink it. <laughs> but anyway, you can do that. But I'll tell you why. And I'll tell you why it works. Because you're thinking of a real person in a real conversation. Because he wants to do that. See, you're not thinking of him as real, so that's why he's not real in your life. But when you do, he'll start to speak to you in ways you can't believe. Because you've always thought of him as, I have to be reverent and say all these prayers. And he's going, I'm sorry, I don't even understand what you're saying. Who wrote that back in when? The 1600s? Stop. Would you use real words for a real God? that wants to sit with you as if he did with Martha. You get that picture? And if you have one cup of coffee, that's all the time I'm talking about. Ten verses. You know how much time, time it takes to listen to ten verses? Because I do that with a U version. One minute. One minute you can listen to ten verses of Scripture. I don't know how fast you drink your coffee. Hopefully it's not that fast. One minute will change your life. One minute a day change your life. If you don't, I'm having a real hard time saying you have a relationship with Jesus. It's really hard to say that. The second cup of coffee, you can watch the news. Can I tell you something? You may want to spend more time with Jesus the second cup and go skip the news. <laughs> okay? That's where I'm at now. It's just like, pfft. you know that happened? Nope. And I'm better off not knowing. I mean, like, in other words, what do I do to affect it? Okay, you get the idea. Enjoy it. Spend some time enjoying it. And the last thing is this, number four, share it. Okay? Don't just keep that to yourself. If Jesus has done something incredible in your life, share it with other people. You know, it would be great. You get your journal, they get theirs, you're reading the Bible, you're scrolling down, or you got your U version and you're keeping notes in that, and you sit down and you go, you know what, can we talk 15 minutes about what we just read? I read it, you read it, we've processed it, and now we're just sharing what we learned. And you'll be surprised. They'll tell you things you've never heard before. You'll tell them things you've never heard before. You don't even need any material. And it will change your life. I, I, know, I know this is simple stuff, but here's the problem. Are you worried? If you are, you know what Jesus is saying? Hey, I'm calling your name. John. John. Martha. You get the idea? Barbara. Vera. Okay. <laughs> I'll stop naming names. That's really not good. He's calling your name twice. And he's saying, I know you're doing good stuff. I know how good you are. I know what you're trying to do here, but you're missing it. He's calling out New Branch, and he's saying, if only, after everything else, the leaders met yesterday, and we prayed, and we, and, we, and we strategized, and I'm so excited for what God's going to do in life of this church. But he's saying this. He's not saying we shouldn't do all these things, but here's what he's saying. If there was one thing I would ask you to do, <laughs> I didn't say he did. One thing I'd ask you to do, would you just sit down with me just for a minute? And if you did, 
I'll change your world. If you do, you'll have the best life. If you do, everything else will fall into place. I could say a lot more, but I won't. That's it. That's, that's really it. So I'm going to ask the communion stewards to come at this time. The invite for today is not from me. It's from Jesus Christ himself. He invites us to a table. It is not our table at New Branch. It is his. So you don't have to be part of this church family to be part of this. It's simply this. It's, it's symbols that represent his broken body and shed blood for the complete remission of your sins. If you've never known Christ, you're welcome at this table. All you have to do is ask him. All you have to do is acknowledge that he died on the cross for your sins and receive him. Maybe you never knew that. And if you do, you're saved. If you do, he'll come into your life and change you. But you know, I want to talk to the Christian today too because for some of us, we haven't sat with Jesus in a long time. Now, we've done a lot of things but we haven't had that time with him. And I hope as we, we watch this video, we have a short video with some music and stuff before we take communion together, I hope that you'll look at it and you'll invite Jesus to come in, maybe make a commitment today to say, you know what, it's been a long time. You know, just like you would with your spouse where you go, I've been wanting to be with you for so long, I've been wanting to see you for so long, and it's as if you're sitting down, and the only thing better than receiving Christ the first time is when you realize, I've been away from him for a while, and now I get to spend time with him again. He's not mad at you. You know what he's doing? I want to come sit next to you. Let him do that today, and it will change your life.